The advice provided in this podcast is general in nature. For your specific situation, you will need to get in contact with your local OT, vehicle modifier or mobility dealer and set yourself up with an assessment or a trial. Trials really do put you in the driver's seat, so get out there and get one going. Before we get started, we just want to do a quick shout out to our sponsors who make this show possible, Mobility Engineering, Driving Well and Williams OT. This show takes time and money to put together and we are forever grateful for their passion for our industry. Okay, enough of the business. Let's get on to the interview with Jenny and Brad. Welcome everybody to the Drive Able podcast. I'm Jenny Gribben from Driving Well Occupational Therapy in Brisbane. And here over there is, is Brad Williams. Good morning, Brad. Hey, how are you going? Hi. Good, I'm really good. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, today, I'm very, very excited to have a guest that I've been working with since the start of COVID, um, Dr. Miriam Monaghan from the Driver Re- Rehabilitation Institute in the USA. And she is a, uh, an occupational therapist and clinician, a researcher, a lecturer, um, and an app inventor. Uh, in the drive in the driving space. So Miriam's been working for many years, uh, particularly interested in the learner driver space and working with young people who are interested in learning to drive and who may have diagnoses such as autism and ADHD. Um, and she basically has developed what's called what we are calling now the potential to drive approach, which um, I, I have worked with her to basically um, implement and roll that approach out here in Australia and many, many driving OTs across the country are using Miriam's Miriam's training, which is really exciting. So we, we interviewed you in yeah, episode 38 and right. 79 about this as well, didn't we? So the, the listeners right. can go back and check that out for sure. Yeah, episode 78 and 79 um, that um, Brad interviewed me late, late 2023. Um, and talked about those changes that have occurred here in Australia. So um, I connect with Miriam regularly and we doing a lot of projects together, um, but I'm really, really excited because Brad hasn't met her before and I'm really excited to get in and have a conversation about her history and what she's doing now and what's coming next. So Brad, are you ready to get into it and meet Miriam? After listening to your interview, uh, when we interviewed you back in uh, 78, 79, mm. um, I can't wait to get this un- underway and, and meet her in person. Um, before we do that, uh, I just want to do a shout out to you. Well done on your first introduction and coming over to the Drive Able <laughs> podcast. Well done. Uh, all of our listeners, give her a round of applause. She's done her first introduction and um, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Driving Well Occupational Therapy loves working with people of all ages and with all kinds of medical conditions to safely give them the opportunity to explore their driving goals. Hi everyone, Uh, I'm really excited to get into the Drive Able podcast today. Um, Brad and I are here with Dr. Miriam Monaghan from the Driver Rehabilitation Institute in the USA. Welcome Miriam, it's so lovely to have you. It's lovely to be with both of you. Wonderful. Um, so Miriam, we've, we've given a little bit of introduction about you um, just earlier in the podcast, but would you would you introduce yourself and tell us about yourself? Okay. Um, I am a occupational therapist that in the United States, we call them driving rehabilitation specialists. I'm a certified driving rehabilitation specialist. Um, and much of my career, I've also been a driving school instructor um, and I have had the pleasure of working in this field in hospital settings and private practice, as well as research and um, academics. So I've really, I, there really isn't an area that I haven't covered at this point in my career. And um, it, it's been really an exciting journey for me. That's so yeah, to talk to you about your journey and and how you've got to yeah. where you are now. I I can't wait to unpack this uh, for all of our listeners. Um, <laughs> Miriam is very well known uh, in this space, and it is very exciting to have her on board. and And Jenny and Miriam have worked a lot together uh, in the past, and and I'm actually going to take a little bit more of a backseat in this podcast, and I'm going to learn a lot more, just like our listeners. So. I can't wait to get this underway. Let's let's get into it. Um, 
That's a really, really good point, Brad. It's like how, how, why are we talking to a, an occupational therapist from the, U, the USA? <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure you've got your side of the story to that, Miriam, but I'll, the basically um, when COVID started, um, I did a little bit of Googling and reaching and research because we couldn't work at that point because of social distancing. We couldn't do um, on-road assessments for a while. And I had been dabbling with the question around how best do we support learner drivers, particularly with autism and ADHD, because we were getting a lot of referrals here in, in Brisbane and Queensland, and I know other driving OTs across the country were as well. And I, I just thought I had to be able to do it in a better way. And so I started Googling and and my my philosophy on life is is work smarter and not harder and and find the people that know the answers rather than trying to find the answers <laughs> yourself. And I actually my my googling search very very quickly um, found an article of like a, a a a news story that Miriam had been featured in, and um, I went sure enough I found her website straight away and. Um, her contact details and reached out by email and I was amazed that she actually responded to me by email within 24 hours and then about 24 <laughs> hours later we were on a Zoom chat together uh, and then she had developed this incredible workshop um, and um, the Drive Focus app which we're going to talk about a bit today and yeah. that conversation turned into um a series of workshops for driving OTs and driving instructors on Australia, in Australia. And, yeah, it's just been this incredible journey and wonderful friendship and professional relationship that, you know, <laughs> from that initial email to, five, five, you know, five years later that we're still um, sure. working on things yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's how I remember it, Miriam. Let, let's go back a little bit, Miriam. Tell us how yeah. you, how did you become an OT and how did you get into the driving space? Mm. Sure. So I, um, I, I became an OT actually um, because I was shadowing physical therapists and thinking that was my path and I didn't even know what OT was. And you have to realize that I graduated in 1995 and at that time you still people would say to you what exactly is an occupational therapist so it goes back in some time before it's it's certainly much more recognized today yeah. at least I can that, you know. ask that. Well, it sounds like it's the same troubles in America as it is in Australia <laughs> what, what is an OT and uh, we're still explaining it uh, to a lot of people every day um, so okay. I'm, glad, I'm glad it's global that's good. It's, a, it's certainly a global challenge for sure. So um, uh, I actually, I just fell in love with the profession and, and um, you know, long story short, I just shadowed that a lot of OTs practicing in a variety of areas. Um, my first position as an OT after school was at a small rural hospital and um, there were seven occupational therapists and we had weekly meetings. And I don't think I was more than three months is as an OT when the manager of our department asked if anybody would be interested in starting a driver rehabilitation program. And um, I kind of, my eyes scanned the room and no one was volunteering. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'd like to make a good impression. I just don't want to step on any toes. And if nobody's into it, then why not? So I raised my hand and that has definitely been a pivotal moment in my life. And I know exactly where I was sitting in that room and the journey that was going to unfold after agreeing to do that. I really didn't know anything about driving. And there were two women in, in, uh, the floor in Florida that were training occupational therapists on doing driver rehab. And I spent a week with them and, um, then subsequent courses after that spent time with them and got my, my, uh, my skills good enough to go ahead and start doing assessments and training. Cause in the United States, I, I just do need to explain. There's a little bit, there, there is a significant difference in the way that we do driver rehabilitation that also I'll, I'll come to, but, um, basically assessment and training techniques and then getting, getting going in that. Um, so that's, that's basically how I, 
got into that, but it maybe makes sense to explain a little bit about the role in the United States and how it's a little bit different. Um, we do not really have much of an, there are some minor coverage with insurances, but basically driver rehabilitation isn't covered by insurance. So people pay out of pocket for it. Um, and so consequently, I think that has been one of the drivers where OTs have sat in the front seat and then the driving school instructor as well. So most of us in the United States have a dual background of a driving school instructor and an OT. But um, there are, um, but but it's also because you know some of us like being in the front seat. I I actually love being in the front seat. I gather a lot of information. But like many people in the, like many OTs in the field, I actually began for my first five years. I was in the same setup as as you folks are in the sense that as a BOT, I was sitting in the back and the driving school instructor that I was working with supplied the vehicle and he sat up in the front seat and, and managed it as well. So I do understand that model as well. But yeah, that kind of explains explains that piece. Yeah, well, Miriam, I, I've followed that American model uh, myself, and um, we've we've just uh, recorded an episode with Chris in uh, Western Australia, across the other side of Australia, and he has a similar model as well. And we unpacked the differences between um, the different models of sitting in the front seat and sitting in the back seat, and and the pros and cons of that. So, listeners, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. We won't talk about that in this podcast, but you can also go back to the previous podcast episode and, and check that out with, with Chris from WA. Um, could you tell us uh, a little bit more then about what the role is like in the US as well? Like, can you can you talk to us about where where are the clients coming from? Are, are they returned veterans, or are they a, a wide variety, a, a big spectrum of disabilities and and issues? Yeah. Or, or how does I, it operate? I think it's probably very similar to you um, in that you have an experienced driver group that would be somebody who now has a, a new acquired disability where they may have a spinal cord injury. They might have a neuromuscular disorder. They might have a cognitive impairment from a traumatic brain injury, acquired multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, dementia, Alzheimer's. So I would imagine that's very similar to what you see. But then there's the new driver group, um, people that have never driven before, um, which has really been the, the the biggest focus of my career, but not, I've certainly done it all. Um, but my particular interest has been in new drivers with disabilities. And that spans from cerebral palsy to autism to ADHD. You know, um, years ago, spina bifida was a thing, but um, that's not something you see as much anymore, um, which is wonderful. Um, and um, yeah, the, you know, and a lot of nonverbal learning disability um, and, and other learning challenges, developmental disabilities of, of a variety. So that's where I've spent most of my focus, but that's kind of the gamut of everything that we practice. Um, and that's, and that's pretty typical for, for most driving programs. So how did you, how did you go from seeing those clients to working out with the, with the, the learner driver group? working out this better way to to assess them how did you, how what was the what was the process and how did you come up with that right right so it's a great question um it's it's sort of where you were in 2020 when you contacted me which is which was um i i was when i started doing this the internet really wasn't that strong <laughs> So um, I, I did some limited calling of colleagues because that's what we did at the time, but it was the same sort of thing. Um, by this point, I've been, I'm going to say I was practicing in driver rehab for about five years when I came to the point of 
going, huh, okay, so this, this, it was actually an occupational therapy assistant, um, the mother of a, of a young person with autism had approached me and said, you know, you're seeing all these older adults and, and, you know, experienced drivers, can you help me figure out if my daughter should even pursue driving? It would help us a lot with our planning. Um, and it struck me as something like, yes, we should be able to do that. And then um, there's an organization here in the United States called the Association for Driving Rehabilitation Specialists. And um, it's a great organization for networking and connecting. And I think that's the thing that I've gotten the most out of that. And at the time, again, I only have about five years of experience when this question comes up. So I contacted all the people that were sort of leaders in the field and I asked them. And the, the answer I got was, well, you just start teaching them how to drive. Mm -hmm. And if they plateau and they don't get better, um, then... Yeah. You know, it's it's it should stop. And mm -hmm. I really struggled with that. I, I felt like we we've got to be able to do something better. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's also helpful to sort of understand and have that historical perspective of where we were. Um, when I I did my my doctorate, I was able to do a whole history on um, driving assessments and uh, you know driver assessor. Um, slash driving rehabilitation specialist, like where did we come from? What were we doing? When did actually standardized assessments come into play and, and so forth? It, it wasn't really until the mid nineties that we had standardized assessments that we could look at say an older driver with dementia. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps to have that lens and understand that there was a lot of work that was done in, the 90s and early 2000s in that area of looking at, you know, assessments for Parkinson's, assessments for multiple sclerosis, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's certainly got a lot and just general older driver safety, right? We've got, we've got standardized tools for that group. Um, we're, we're, with new drivers, we're, I'm gonna say right now, we're similar to where we were in the late 90s with our knowledge for assessments, if that makes sense. Um, we're, we're poised at a place where we've got a lot more information than we did in the early 2000s. But when I made those calls and got that additional, with that recommendation, there was literally nothing. There was no research on autism and driving. So there was zero things. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I, one thing I have learned about myself from people that have worked with me is that I approach things very mechanistically. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that means is I look at the condition. So I looked at autism and I said, what are the characteristics of autism? And then looking at a task analysis of driving, where might there be a, a challenge problem at the intersection of driving and the autism characteristic? And then I'm looking at, okay, now we've got to figure out how we're going to assess these individuals before they start learning how to drive, because I don't want to go that approach of just, just start them driving and, and see when they plateau. I didn't like the idea of doing that, that what everybody else was doing for reasons that I didn't even fully understand until later how how critically important it was to do a driving assessment before they even start driving because if you go down that path and they fail um, and maybe they have potential in the future it's very hard to get somebody with autism to, to believe in themselves and get back on that road to learning how to drive so you want to make sure that you don't start them prematurely but um, so I just mechanistically looked at these things, as I was saying, you know, just layering these things and looking at, you know, OK, could I come up with passenger activities that that would look at those same skills that were utilized in driving that might be challenging for somebody with autism? And then the other pieces, are there any standardized assessments that are validated for people with autism that assess the skills that are used in driving. So it was really looking at both of those. Um, and it took me 
a good three or four years of just dabbling with it clinically before I did my first workshop. Yeah, wow. What year was that, the first workshop? Uh, it was 2006 was the first workshop that I, I gave. And that one wasn't just specific on autism. It was really looking at cerebral palsy and yeah. anybody with a potential cognitive impairment um, from or cognitive challenge is a better way of saying it um, from a developmental disability, you know, yeah. and, and looking at if they had the skills that were needed for driving. So, Miriam, I'm wondering what is what is the uptake been? Like, you know, you started the delivered the first workshop in 2006 to other driving um, driving rehabilitation specialists and o, slash OTs in the states. Yes. Where, and where where were you physically, geographically at that that time? I was in Houston, Texas. In Texas. So Miriam's and, just moved around a bit, which is really exciting. Okay. <laughs> Is living in Vermont, the, the conference would happen to be in Houston, right. Texas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and what is the uptake of that overall approach for learner drivers been with from an OT perspective, but also from you know, a parent and family and client perspective and a government perspective? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it, well, first of all, like, you know, I think it's been well received within the professional community. Um, I know, um, I, I think a lot of people have ad adopted it, maybe even changed it, adjusted it um, slightly for their own needs, what they feel was would be a little bit better. Um, but I think the good news is, is that most people are not, you know, just starting to teach someone how to drive and, and get them going. Um, and, and as far as like, it, again, in the United States, we really don't have any government oversight. Um, driving rehabilitation isn't even a regulated profession. Anybody can call themselves a driving rehabilitation professional in the United States, which, which causes a whole other set of problems, which I won't get us into. But I think it's been well received as far as coming up with a different different technique. Um, the Association for Driver Rehabilitation Specialists have has um, tried to, you know, create more of a professional track for things. And so we have a badge program. Um, so you can be a vision specialist and get a certified badge on that. So you're doing driving rehabilitation, but you're known for, for this, you have extra training in that area. Um, and so I have been giving the badge courses for the association since the inception of the autism and driving badge. Um, and um, so that's been, been exciting. I think the last workshop I did in 2023 had 100 attendees in one big room, um, which is a pretty good size. You just have to, you have to realize that there's only 365 driving rehabilitation specialists in the United States and Canada. So to get 100 of them in your room is a pretty good percentage. 365. Oh. I know. Well, you get to remember some of the, the challenges we have here. It's not a funded, people are paying out of pocket. Um, there's, uh, it's not, you know, you don't have regulations in most states, not every state. Some states, there are regulations that, as for example, after a stroke that you have to go um, and be assessed by a driving rehabilitation specialist. But that's, those those states are far and few between. So you literally, the doctors have the choice to, to either say, go and see a driving rehabilitation specialist or go to the Department of Motor Vehicle to get an on-road assessment. Um, and so it's not, it's not quite as full. It still needs to grow. Um, there's no question about it. There's been a lot of energy in trying to make, you know, trying to get more people um, more occupational therapists in particular interested in driving. Um, but it's been definitely an uphill battle on that. There's no question about it. Well, that, that doctor approach sounds very uh, familiar to uh, Australia. So the doctors are the ones that are quite often in control of that choice of whether we need a further assessment or go back to driving 
um, but then they get to choose what level of, of assessment. Uh, quite often they don't know that the OTs are out there doing this kind, kind of work either. So that bit there sounds very familiar, but we are very fortunate to have the NDIS uh, assisting uh, and the insurance schemes like Return to Work, um, TAC, LSA, um, Comcare, those type of things around, mm -hmm. which do offer funding uh, for, for these complex assessments in Australia. And I think um, as well, Brad, where it's, it's, it's funny how different countries sort of go about the whole space because, you know, we've mm -hmm. also got um, a national document called the Assessing Fitness to Drive Guidelines, which, you know, we're, we're a much... Um, smaller country and population, and we've only got oh, I can't even count the number of states that we have, Brad. Seven, seven states yep. and territories. Um, <laughs> um, and, and each state and territory has their own jurisdiction and Oops. processes and guidelines specifically, but overarching, we do have a national document that does outline the med different medical conditions and, and when a, what a doctor does need to consider when someone has had a stroke has had right. has had Parkinson's does have dementia and, and it does it does state whether a practical driving assessment is um is recommended so we we are lucky to have that that body of work and that's something that has that undergoes review you know, you know every five years or so so um there have been some updates yeah. to that as as you know after after um the the work that we've been able to do together in Australia with the potential to drive space that there's been some updates to that um, submissions in, into the that document and um, on, ongoing education is is needed um, as to why why that's you know right recommendations but yeah definitely moving in the right direction mm. yes and I think our biggest drivers for for getting the potential to drive clients to the United States is actually parents yeah parents that just don't know which direction to go whether to pursue driving or not and mm. they do a little web search and they've they find programs like mine or they find the the association organization and go from there. Mm. But um, I don't think doctors are as as great with that new population as far as understanding mm. our services for them. Um, now, yeah. in in episode 78 and 79 on the, on the podcast, uh, we I actually interviewed Jenny before mm. she became a co-host about the potential to drive you put out the the word potential to drive mm -hmm. talk to us a bit more about the potential to drive people can go back and listen to episode um 78 uh, in particular from the australian uh, approach and and driving well with jenny but talk to us about how how the potential to drive actually came about mm -hmm. um who's involved what what's it about and what research is is behind it Ah, okay. That's a that's a lot of pieces. Um, so, it is. <laughs> start, start with one. <laughs> so it came to be out of my work with um, young people who I wanted to try to figure out if we had a better way to assess somebody's potential to actually drive, and the outcomes would be they're good to go and they can go through a traditional driver training program, or they need somebody with specialized skills like myself who could then teach them how to drive um, considering their learning preferences and structuring the training in such a way that they'll benefit from that. Um, a third possibility was that they weren't quite ready to drive and there were some skills they needed to work on and then I could provide um, the young person and their parents with targeted skills in which they needed to work on. Um, and then lastly, the other, the other piece was they just, it didn't look likely that they had the potential to drive. So I would recommend more working on, um, alternative transportation skills so that they could, because of the power of mobility, we want to make sure that everybody has as much access as they can 
um, using that. So that it was to basically identify which of the four outcomes were the most beneficial for that person at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I think that answered a lot of questions for parents because they knew, you know, going forward, whether their child would foreseeably be a driver in the future. Um, mm -hmm. I think for planning purposes, where are they going to live? What jobs are they going to take? All of that is all filtered into the mobility component. Um, and so understanding that and, and being able to prepare for that um, was, I think, has been probably the the most beneficial for many of the parents. So, um, so how did how did you then develop that program? Like how did how did you sort that out to be able to offer that advice to parents um, for their drivers? Like what what research did you do? How did we get there? So as as I was saying, there wasn't any research out there at that time. But what I did was I started going to a lot of courses and workshops. Um, there was one particular course, and I apologize, I cannot remember who the instructor was, who covered adolescence and autism. And um, I went to as many courses as I could about autism. And then I took what I knew about driving and the task analysis of all the components from visual perception to processing speed to all the motor control parts, all the things that we know are integral to driving and looking at, okay, where are things connecting? Where, where do I need to be concerned about? Um, for example, one of my first ahas was individuals with autism um, tend to see everything as equal. So everything seems to be equal. The, the ability to prioritize things is more challenging to them. But then another aha was they're very good with rules. So if you can make rules for things, they can acquire that. They're very visual. So, okay, so they're not gonna have trouble necessarily with the visual aspects of driving, but they might have difficulty with prioritizing what's important. They may or may not have difficulty with motor coordination. We know where motor coordination comes into driving, right? Um, and so I was able to take those pieces together and look at that, but then say to myself, okay, I want to create something that is better, um, at least for my own use in the clinic, than just starting to teach somebody how to drive and asking them to go get their learner's permit and, and pursue it. So what can I do to figure out whether they have those, those skills before they even know the rules of the road? And so then coming up with four passenger activities that were really critical to looking at those skills that somebody with autism might experience as challenges while also, um, uh, you know, being able to put that all together. So, the passenger activities, there's four of them. Um, there's the one that is a lane position activity. Most of my people with autism do very well with this. They just need to recognize where the car is in the lane, but it's a great warm up. but it gives me an information about whether somebody has more visual perceptual challenges um, or whether it might be attention. So for example, I have two people I'm working with right now. Um, the young man had um, some difficulty with that lane position activity. Um, and uh, the young girl had zero trouble with that lane position activity. When I'm teaching them how to drive, both of them are having trouble staying in their lane. She's having trouble because of attention. Mm -hmm. He's having trouble because of visual perception. Mm -hmm. And so I need to approach the solution in a way when I'm training them in a way that is getting at the underlying problem. So for him, reference points are really important. For her, it's calling her attention to it by saying, what blame position are you in right now? Mm -hmm. And then she recognizes it and goes back. So. By doing that cueing to her, I'm trying to get her to self-cue where she is um, in the lane. So 
that's the first first one. The second one is the visual search activity so that I can see how quickly they can process information on the roadway. And I'm only asking them to identify one stimulus that is important for a driver to notice at a time. And then I add one and I add one and I'm trying to get up to about six or seven. So for example, brake lights of the vehicle in front. So another big aha to me when I went to these workshops on autism is that they don't understand nonverbal cues. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little embarrassed to say that it probably took me eight or nine clients before I started to realize how they didn't understand the lights of the vehicle ahead of them to the tail, the lights that are basically on the rear of the vehicle. And then I realized those are nonverbal cues. Yep. That's why they can't distinguish uh, or naturally distinguish, if you will, without specific training, the difference between brake lights versus reverse lights versus headlights on. Um, when the headlights are on, the taillights are on. They're, ha they're pretty hard to distinguish between the, um, the, you know, distinguish which one. And then you can add the whole other layer of that, which is, now you're looking at the back of a Tesla, you're looking at the back of a Prius, you're looking at the back of an old Chevy. They all look different. And that ability to generalize information from one thing to another can be very challenging for this population. So that was another important part that I learned. So what I'm trying to say is what I had to do is really understand the subject matter well, which was autism then take what I knew about driving and put those together because there wasn't anybody that was helping me create an assessment. So I needed to figure that out. And then also say to myself, what standardized assessment tools are would give me the information about, for example, visual perception or visual motor integration that this population has trouble with that would also inform me more information about driving. And I think one of the things that really came out of it was also looking at a young person's life skills, which was part of that whole autism assessment, for example, potential drive assessment. I cannot tell you the number of parents that still see me today for the first time who check that they're, they wouldn't, they supervise their child's ability to cross the street. Yeah. Well, if you can't cross the street, we shouldn't be talking. If you can't multiply, you shouldn't be learning calculus. You know, I mean, there's there's things build on each other, and it's really important that we have a, a young person has some experience in their life um, that's even beyond just like the obvious of crossing the street. Okay, everybody gets the connection to driving there, but things that maybe don't become so obvious is, you know, things like doing laundry, you know, paying attention to planning ahead. When what do you need to wear your uniform to school or to, to a sports practice or something and it needs to be cleaned at a, in advance? Well, that's planning ahead, very similar to driving. We plan how we're gonna get there, what time we need to leave, um, and think through those steps, very, very similar. In addition to just operating the machine and following the directions. Um, so um, sometimes laundry or, or it can be part of the homework. And okay. Jenny knows my, my absolute favorite is, is um, I'll use the correct term here, the trolley in the, gro in the grocery store. You know, you guys, um, we all know that pushing, like if you think about it, pushing a cart through an aisle and navigating around other people in the environment, when you come to the end of the aisle and you've got this trolley in front of you, it makes it difficult to see who's coming and going from the crossway. So being able to, to um, those life skills are so foundational to driving. Mm -hmm. And there's two problems that can happen for some of the young people that haven't developed those foundational skills. Sometimes it's just parents are very busy. They want to do it the fastest way they possibly can. And I get it. But but sometimes what we need to do as therapists is bring it to their attention that these are skills that they need to develop 
that'll be foundational for driving. Um, can you ask um, a stranger in a store where the restroom is? Well, that's like direction. Sometimes we have to interact with strangers once we get someplace, you know? Um, and that's that's all part of driving. So those- It's about the parents not having given the opportunity to develop those skills. Yes, and sometimes it's the parent, and sometimes I say to the parent, I mean, what is the barrier to that? Um, and usually it's because they haven't devoted time to it or that the child isn't particularly motivated. Um, if it's the latter, they're unlikely to be motivated to learn how to drive. Um, their, their motivation to learning how to drive is a huge part of this. Um, I have seen young people in their 20s pulling their mother's arm, trying to walk away from the office because they don't want to be any part of this assessment. Um, for somebody with autism, learning to drive can be really easy. Um, it, it, they can be that, you know, individual that can go through a regular driving program. But if they need the specialized training that, for example, I would provide, we're looking from what the research tells us today is three times longer to learn how to drive, generally speaking. That's generally, so it could be four times for that individual. And I remind parents that this is this is one of the hardest things your child is ever going to do if they they need these services. And so they have to really want this. Mm -hmm. um, it's super important. Oh, I, I'm going to sign up for the course. I have to I have to uh, dive into this <laughs> a lot more. I, I haven't signed up to it. Our staff have signed up to it, but I haven't done it yet. But I'm going to I'm definitely going to uh, do this as well. Um, Good. Good. <laughs> yeah, I should too. Um, There's um, one spot left just for you, Brad. Oh, is that right? Okay. Um, I'm actually covering all the workers when they're <laughs> when they're coming. Um, the drive focus, though. The drive focus. Now, this is something else that's been developed, uh, and you use the word focus a lot in the early part of the interview. How you focused your attention in on uh, autism and driving. But tell us about the Drive Focus um, app and, and how that developed. Williams Occupational Therapy focused their attention on helping people with their mobility needs. From driving to wheelchairs, Williams OT provides help to get people mobile. Sure. Um, so everybody, uh, understandably, because they when they think of me, they think of autism and driving, that they think that the the, the actual moment that this idea came into my head to do drive focus or create drive focus um, came from working with somebody with autism and that is not at all what happened. Um, it came from actually working with a young woman who had a very mild concussion. And um, I, I think anybody who's done driving assessments knows that like if they work with somebody with say for example a traumatic brain injury or a stroke you can watch them drive and they're doing really well but then there's just that one moment where they miss a stop sign or they miss a traffic light it's just one thing or they get in the wrong turn lane um, that is just even if it just happens once in the assessment it, it is significant because you have to ask yourself is there an underlying cause for this or was it just a haphazard error and then of course how they manage the mistake um, and what i i found with this particular woman she was she was I, i've never met anybody quite like her in the sense that she self-referred her well she talked to her doctor because she was a mom of a couple of young kids and she had this concussion where she was seen in the hospital emergency room and then immediately discharged so this was a really mild injury they sent her home and they told her she could resume all activities including driving and in the first six months after this after the injury she was wrapping up tickets she was getting honked at she had a couple of minor collisions and she got scared 
and she contacted her doctor and her doctor referred her to me. I put her through what we had for assessments at that time, which wasn't great. Um, but then I also, and I mean by what wasn't great for us is that there really wasn't the research yet. The research hasn't come through at this point. And um, when I took her out on the road, I, she drove flawlessly. There wasn't a single mistake. But she had reported things like missing a stop sign at, at an intersection. This is and, very familiar to a client that I had about a year ago. And my client would turn to the left, so driving on the left side of the road in Australia, turning to the left, going into a slip lane at traffic lights. So the traffic lights would cross, but you'd be in a little side slip lane. And she would be able to attend to it majority of the time. But other times she would look and she just would pull out in front of other cars. Had her license, passed her license beautifully, but keep kept on this area um, was a, a real specific area of concern for her. But as we unpacked it, there was other areas of where she was missing information. So how did you develop it from, from this point with your lady into what it is now? It was a very similar path to, and I think it's just because the way my brain is wired, a very similar path to what I did with the autism piece. I thought about the fact that what do we think about with traumatic brain injury and cognition? What do we know about that? Well, when somebody's first in uh, a serious state in, in recovery, we keep the lights down low. We keep the, aud the auditory sounds low. We try not to present too many stimuli. So if you think about just even being in a bathroom with somebody um, for the first time when they're grooming after such a thing, they, you know, you maybe just put the toothpaste out and the toothbrush and you keep the number of stimuli down so that they can succeed with those, those things. And that is exactly what I just was like, okay, she's, the reason she's missing things is because she's trying to process everything at once. And I went by that gut feeling. And again, coming back, it's very much like what I was talking about, looking at the characteristics of autism, looking at her medical condition and saying, okay, what could be about that? And so I took an eight by 11 sheet of paper out. I sketched out basic things about roadways. And I said, I only want you to be looking for these stimuli. And I said, a stop sign, a traffic light, a pavement turn marking, cars coming in from the right and left. And, you know, there was a number of things. It certainly wasn't as perfected at that time because I'm doing it at, on the spot, literally in the car, drawing it out. And then I said, let's go drive again with keeping in mind those things. And she said, I feel so much more relaxed now because I'm focused on what I need to look for. Um, so what I did was the same thing we would have done in early rehab. Of, of just decreasing the amount of stimuli and telling her this is what you need to pay attention to and and those other things just ignore them you don't need to notice them and um where i saw her was it was i had like an hour and a half drive from that hospital i used to travel to hospitals and, and see people in my own private practice and um i had about an hour and a half drive home and the more i thought about how much she benefited from that. I thought, gosh, there's got to be, you know, other people I work with have this issue too. You know, Parkinson's has this issue, you know, so forth. And, and eventually came to autism. Um, and in fact, I'm not even sure I was seeing autistic clients at that time. I mean, literally, this was pretty early on. It was so early on, um, I giggle about it, but I, I use PowerPoint for the very first time to create these slides, pictures of roadway scenes. And we put circles around the things that were important to notice. And my husband had to teach me how to do this because I had never even touched PowerPoint. I never even put a circle on an image. And I didn't even know how to insert pictures. I mean, this PowerPoint thing was brand new. 
Um, that's how long ago it was. And so eventually that visual search skills program had 65 slides of pictures. So the first, what we did was we showed an image of a regular roadway scene. You had an eight by 11 sheet of paper that was like your cue card of what things you needed to notice. And you pointed it out on, on the picture. Then the next picture um, showed what you did need to focus on by the duplicate photo, but this time it had circles, red circles highlighting around the object. Right. You fast forward, I go down to the University of Florida and I work with uh, an incredible researcher there. Her name is uh, Dr. Sherilyn Clausen. And I had gone to work for her specifically to look at autism and driving. But she has a huge driving community mobility research lab. And so there are always multiple projects going on. She also had this um, combat veteran study going on. And we talked about the issues that the combat veterans were experiencing. And I had some experience coming from Vermont, where I was working with our National Guard people who were coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq as well. But um, what I said was what, you know, was worth looking at was whether we could use these um, uh, pictures of roadway scenes to reorient the veterans from looking at things that were important to notice in theater to what is important for civilian driving. Mm -hmm. And good things came of that. Um, I really saw firsthand because I was involved in actually doing the research that that was very beneficial to reorient them to what was important for a civilian to notice because we all got pretty passive with our visual search when it comes to driving. And I was in a car with my husband and I was telling him how much I thought the veterans were benefiting from this silly little visual search skills tool. And um, I asked him the question that changed our lives, which was, do you think there's the technology has moved far enough along that we could actually take video and put hotspots in the video and have them click on that so that the veteran in a rural area that didn't have access to an OT could benefit from that. So that's we basically yes. how it came, <laughs> it came to be. Yeah. But he thought, he thought that technology had moved far enough that we had, he could cob it together in a, in a three day weekend. And mind you, he's a physicist. He's not a technology person, but he's self-trained pretty darn well. But it took us um, three years working with developers to come up with um, what is still to this day, very unique technology that you won't find used in any other way. Um, other than this of taking videos of real roadway scenes and making the objects like brake lights and traffic lights and um, pavement markings that are important to, for a driver to notice clickable and hot, which is, I mean, when have you clicked on a video? Most of us have never clicked on a video before. Um, so that's how that happened. So you've, you've developed this uh, program to pinpoint uh, visual searching and, and visual uh, attention onto the specifics that we need it. But uh, you drive uh, in America on the other side of the road to us and the road markings are different to what we've done, uh, what we've got here in Australia. So different traffic lights are even in a different position where you've got them across cables uh, across the top of the, the roadway where we've got them off to mm -hmm. one side and, and different sign markings and stuff like that. How can, how can we utilize this drive focus in in australia well first of all i just want to mention that um it is an intervention tool it was never designed to be an assessment tool and um you would not have australian drives had it not been for jenny and my me connecting so what happened was in our conversations and our workshops um, there was a real interest to making Australian content and Jenny has graciously volunteered many hours to not only film um, drives in, in Australia. So we have Brisbane and Melbourne, 
I've learned how to pronounce that right. Um, <laughs> well done. Well done. That. Um, but um, and uh, just a week ago, I think we, um, Jenny and uh, Megan, um, and I, I have to actually say Megan Col is it Coulter? That's right. Okay, I was just wondering if I was pronouncing it right. She filmed uh, in in Melbourne, and the two of them filmed in Sydney just a week ago. So we will be processing that film probably for the next few months, and then we'll have um, uh, footage from there. Everything is laid out in the Drive Focus app. As I mentioned, it's really an intervention tool. You start out in low driving complexity areas, and then you have to get a score of 500 or higher out of a possible thousand points to advance to the next thing. So a lot of people enjoy it because it's like a gaming experience um, where they are want to get a better score. Um, Drive Focus has gone through many versions and evolutions um, as any technology program does. And we have things that you can act, ways that you can actually watch like a little clip of the object that you missed so that you can go back and play it again and make sure that you click on that particular object. Yeah, and then we really have our function is is so incredible because you'll let the let the client go through, say in a in a therapy session, you use drive focus as a as an intervention and training tool to help them develop those visual search and processing skills and the speed of that recognition as well. And then you can actually go through and look at what their score was and there's a table breakdown that says there were this many traffic lights and they got this many of them. There were this many road markings and they got this many of them and then drop that score mm -hmm. detail down and every single one of those critical items and the and the um, the timestamp mark of where that was in the video, you click on that and that video comes up here it was. Like it's it's just phenomenal. Um, and I think what's so brilliant about about the app is so it's a tablet based app. Um, so you're you're you know you're, you're tapping on the on the tablet screen and and most young people are used to using that and you know most um, adults are used to using that kind of technology now so it's so readily available. And the cost of the app, so in Australia, we're talking about $22 Australian, depending on the exchange rate of the day, but it's usually around $22 Australian. And for that one little fee, you get access to the whole app and then all of these ongoing developments that Miriam and her team and, and our, you know, teeny contribution from Australia, um, that, you know, next time you go on the app, oh, there's another city. <laughs> Um, that you can go and play with. So, and even, you know, having the opportunity to, um, for more, more of our advanced um, students, if they wanted to, they could go in and do um, Vermont and Ottawa and, you know, Florida, all of these other cities, as well as a really awesome um, um, fire and rescue um, drive where they're actually in the in the front cab of a, a fire engine en route to an emergency so you've got lights and sirens and radios and cars moving out of the way it's chaos but um you know it's it's real it's real real life and what, what they need to learn. yeah 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 so the problem we we've really had is we've had you know most before drive focus it was you know well, do puzzles or something else to improve your visual search or maybe commentary driving as a passenger. Mm -hmm. But this we can very much like OT does, we often isolate a skill before we actually put it in practice. Um, I, an example I'm, I always use is like a tub transfer. Like the night before you do an actual maybe bathing situation with a client in, in true, you know, typical OT practice, you might do it with the clothes on, the shoes on, and, and just isolate that transfer technique um, on there. We're just isolating the visual search component of driving, um, which is so critical because it's the first thing. If you, if you miss something on the roadway that is important to notice, then there's a cascade of problems. You can't you can't make a decision about how to react to it. You can't physically respond to it because you didn't see it to begin with. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I think I, it's just a, a really important tool um, to, to have access to because there's nothing quite mm -hmm. like it.
Well, it sounds to me as if it's also um, getting some components from pediatrics where we're learning through play. Um, mm. and, and it's a, that challenge, it's that, that play mentality where you're exploring and building on what you've done before. And, and yeah. we know how powerful that can be. It's sometimes that can't be done in the car because of, of risk. You, you've got to, mm. we can add on a little component as long as we're in back streets and it's, mm. and we can predict the environment, but we can't always predict the environment. So uh, this sound, it sounds wonderful for a, a great learning and play opportunity to, to right. have fun with it as well. I would also say that the other piece that's so important that it gives us, if we go out driving with somebody, we, we are taking driving errors to recognize if they saw something or didn't see something, right? So somebody could conceivably just go through a green light and never see the green light, but because it's green, they didn't make an error. Yeah. And what drive focus is, is forcing to us to be able, or gives us the ability to see on the back end is, you know, that person, did they actually see it because they had to click on it yeah. um, on that green light? Because otherwise we're just functioning off of driving errors. And that's not as not necessarily um, going to create a driving error if you if you miss seeing something, you know? And we don't know as an OT whether they have seen it or not. Right, yeah. Now we've got to measure. Yeah got a measure to see if they're actually seeing it um we've also done an interview with uh, my drive school which is a simulator program that's uh here in in australia as well um, people can go back and listen to that but it, it's very similar to that we can actually monitor somebody's progress and monitor somebody if they're actually doing it or not doing it because um <sighs> because those things are actually recorded and there's an achievement mark and we can move forward with that. So we can do that in safe environments. We can do that in fun environments. We can have rewards with a tick or a, or a mark or a yeah. challenge to be able to move through to the next, the next stage. I, I think it's wonderful. And it's, and it can be, it can be done in a, in a safe and, and happy environment where the well, it can be done in your lounge room. Yeah. Right. This is the thing. Like it's there's so so many challenges in Australia and in the United States with geography, right? And and access to services, access to therapists. That this is a device that once you've bought it on your tablet, you've got it for life. You've got all of these updates, and you can be anywhere, anywhere mm -hmm. to be able to practice this. You don't need to be reliant on having a therapist right there. You don't need to be reliant on trying to access. Um, driving simulator programs, which can be really difficult to access and really expensive and far and few between here in Australia. Um, yeah. Is it something that people can get kickstarted with without a therapist? Can they, can they like Absolutely. a therapist recommend, mm -hmm. yeah, recommend going to download this app and doing it on your tablet mm -hmm. and then they can do that at home and get underway? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, Jenny's doing that quite regularly with her clients before they even come in, correct? For an yeah, assessment? Correct. It's, yeah, it's it's in our information it's on our website, it's on our information. Yeah. You know, start this, this is gonna help you. Even it for not just for our learner drivers either, but for our drivers experienced drivers across the board. Um even, yeah, even our older drivers, a lot of them will download the app and and have a yeah. go and find it really helpful to help that help that attention and be deliberate about noticing everything that they should be noticing. Yeah. And the, the other thing that um, mm. the app does, which a simulator can't do, um, is that you can also adjust the speed. Mm. So you can go at 60 or 80% of the speed that the actual drive was filmed in. Mm. Um, so for some of our drivers after, you know, stroke or traumatic brain injury, um, you know, I think the, one of the hardest things for a therapist is to have to say to them, you're not ready to drive and you're not even ready for intervention um, for driving. But that's where this app fills in and can get them going without having to, you know, endure additional costs for, for somebody who's experienced. Um, and it can be used as a pre-driving component or for our new drivers or it can be actually to get them ready to drive in other words or it can actually be used as um you know uh 
intervention during your, your driver training with somebody. So it has a lot of uses in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Um, I, I love how your brain works, Miriam, and I, I want to tap into it, but is there anything else that you're working I've, on? I've been trying to download Miriam's brain for five oh. years, but I'd like, I'm, I'm in the first in line. If you, if you can figure it out, Jenny, if you can figure it out, let me know because I want to tap into it. Is there, is there anything else that you're working on at the moment, Miriam, that we can get excited about? Um, yes, beside the Sydney drives, um, we have um, uh, readiness to drive checklists that I've been working on with uh, Dr. Ann Dickerson. So we started by using a lot, I, when I initially started doing these potential drive assessments, we just used a, like a, a general life skills assessment and it was very informative, but it wasn't as ideal as making it more driving oriented. So Ann and I have put together um, uh, a, a tool to make it more um, targeted to readiness to drive life skills, if you will. Um, and also um, we're going to make it into an electronic version so that you will actually get information as the therapist about things that you can create goals, goals with that will help um, prepare them for driving. So if they're not ready to drive, you'll be getting some information on that. Um, the other, the other big projects I'm working with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, an amazing team um, that is completely devoted to this space of autism and driving and community mobility. Um, and they, I'm involved in, I think it's a total of four research projects with them right now. Um, the one that we're working on right now is standardizing a screening tool for autism and driving. Um, the next step, it's already been funded, but the next step will be to um, look at a standardized assessment, which will make all of us much happier um, to have less subjectivity into the assessments. Um, and then um, we're, we'll move into um, training. Um, we've already applied for a grant to fulfill that um, part of like, how do we do the training, whether it's a community mobility training, behind the wheel training, or um, working with Jenny on her program for getting people ready to drive that are not quite ready to drive, but looking at how do we get them ready to drive. And so we're looking at all of those pieces on that. And then other pieces regarding drive focus um, were we put in for another grant, um, but the big things that are going to come out of that is actually some um, uh, a better training section. We've already there, there's a, the training section is is the the least attractive feature of that app. Um, it's unfortunately very necessary to know like what things to pay attention to, what things you can ignore. But we're moving it from sort of text and pictures to an interactive training that looks more similar to the actual driving experience or this, the, the interactive drives that are the core of drive focus. And um, the other piece is still a little bit out there, but we are actively working on um, applications for grants to um, uh, get AI to actually generate um, the hotspots. So um, as Jenny knows that a three minute clip will take us about eight hours to put in all the little clickable hotspots in the video. Again, this, this technology doesn't exist. So it's not like you can just put in a plugin uh, library in terms of technology and just expect that it's gonna go off and take off. So you have to actually put all the hotspots in. So we're gonna, we're, we're applying for funding to make an AI generated piece. So you, Brad, will be able to do driving on your routes mm -hmm. and put it into the AI generator in our app. And then it'll come up with your program's name on it and you will be able to utilize that um, to you know, say, hey, before we get on this particular route, next time you come, why don't you practice the visual search part of that and have your client work on that? So those are all the things that are working on. I sound exhausted. I'm exhausting myself. Uh, I'm working on all sleep, these Miriam. When do you sleep? How do you, I can't. <laughs> but it's, it's it really, I have great people that I collaborate with. Um, 
the folks at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia are just phenomenal. Um, I have an absolutely dedicated partner in my husband who's all the technology and all the conversations with developers and we work on the website together and all those things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's got a lot of, a lot of great partners out there that make my life a little bit easier. And we have a great filming guy that helps us with editing a lot of the films. So yeah. Shout out to all of them. That's uh, wonderful. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's been a wonderful conversation, Miriam, and, and I really thank you for sharing all of your experiences and what's ahead of you. Um, before we wind up and ask you our final question, which we ask every uh, person that comes on the podcast, we're just going to hear from our sponsors. Mobility Engineering is Australia's leading automotive product supplier for disability customers. We have installers all across the country, over a hundred of them, and we have the largest range of mobility products for vehicles in the country. Get in touch with Mobility Engineering for any of your driving solutions. This is fantastic. Thank you very much. This, I loving this conversation. Thank you very much. Um, she's got a lot to do before she retires, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's not allowed to retire by the sound of it. She's not allowed to retire. Uh, <laughs> or is she handing the baton over to you, Jenny? Is that what's happening? Well, that's what's happening with the workshops here. Uh -huh. yeah. So Miriam, we love to ask our guests a final question uh, in the Drive Able podcast. And we, you know, we've really learned that cars are not just about getting from A to B, but there's so much more. Can you tell us about a special memory that, that you can think of um, to do with driving? Yes, um, I, actually it's more to do with a car. But I think like any of us, we have loose change and odds and ends in our car, right? Yeah. Um, and I was meeting my husband at that time, fiance, Jay, to, um, at the courthouse to purchase a, a marriage license. And um, we didn't realize we had to pay cash for it. So we went in there and we were a buck 50 short and he had his car and I had my car. So we scrambled through looking for change in our car underneath neath the things, you know, floor mats and in little cubbies and glove compartments and whatnot. And um, didn't come with all of it, but we did get at least 75 cents out of the cars. And so then, then it was a matter of panhandling in front of the courthouse to see if we could get the rest of what we needed. <laughs> the car was our first, first stop to look for <laughs> excessive change that might be in there for that buck 50 we were missing. <laughs> and not only are they helping you get from A to B, they're also a, a mobile bank <laughs> for you. For yes, they are helping you get married. Wow. Uh, yeah, very important. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you're able to find enough change uh, to get married <laughs> um, and get your certificate. Uh, just enough maybe to, to um, get the certificate that you needed. Oh, very good. That's wonderful, Miriam. Thank you. So a huge thank you to our guest today on the Drive Able podcast, Dr. Miriam Monaghan from the Driver Re Rehabilitation Institute. Um, if our listeners have any further questions, Miriam, is there any way that they can get in contact? Sure, sure. So the um, Driver Rehabilitation Institute has a website and a contact us page and as well as Drive Focus. Um, in, and just so you know, whenever you write an email or your client writes an email to Drive Focus or Driver Rehabilitation Institute, it comes to me. We do not have a uh, excessive um, operating team. It's just me. So <laughs> I will get your email. I will read it just like Jenny did um, two, four years ago. Yeah. And uh, I will respond to you. So um, feel free to reach out. Thanks, Miriam. And we can put those, um, uh, your website links on, on the recording. Um, thanks Great. so much, Miriam. And um, we'll see you all in the next episode. Stay safe on the roads, everybody. Uh, Miriam, thank you very much. It's been eye-opening. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, everybody, uh, we'll see you in the next episode. As we wind up this episode, please remember that the advice provided in this podcast is general in nature. For your specific situation, you will need to get in contact with your local OT, vehicle modifier or mobility dealer and set yourself up with an assessment or trial. Trials really do put you in that driver's seat.
If you like what you've heard, make sure you like, rate and subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. If you or anyone you know would like to share a story about driving with a disability, or you would like to get in contact, find the show notes, or find the resources mentioned in this episode, you can find us on Facebook. Just search at Drive Able Podcast for more information.